Welcome to Making the Rounds, a podcast by the American Medical Association. In this episode, medical student Tiffy Keung moderates a panel of physician experts who discuss promoting financial literacy in minority first-generation medical students. She's joined by medical student Kabir Graywall, Dr. Michael Sweeney, Director of Surgical Residency and Associate Professor of Clinical Science at Florida State University, and Dr. Sanjay Sharma, Retina Specialist Professor of Ophthalmology of Queens University and Editor-in-Chief of MedSkill, an online learning platform for medical students and physicians. Here's Tiffy Kiyunk. Hello, my name is Tiffy Kyung, and I am a second year medical student at Michigan State University, and I am a part of the American Medical Association Medical Student Section as part of the Minority Issues Committee. And today we are doing a recording for the uh, program entitled Promoting Financial Literacy and Debt Management in Minority First Generation Medical Students. The purpose for writing this program was that because I'm very interested in how first-generation medical students acclimate to medical school, and I know that um, we have certain financial obstacles um, when it comes to either raising money for medical school or just getting through medical school and having large amounts of debt. So um, for today, we have three speakers with us and we will be doing a question and answer style. Um, so first off, we'll have an introduction from Kabir. Hey, thanks for having me. My name is Kabir Graywall. I'm finish, finishing up my third year of medical school at the Florida State University College of Medicine. Um, I wanna be part of this committee because I was an economics major in college. I served as the president of the business and medicine organization at the FSU College of Medicine. And I also helped publish a research article about how FSU is utilizing a personal finance elective to help educate our own medical students about personal finance. Next up, we have Dr. Sweeney. Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, it's Mike Sweeney from Florida State University College of Medicine. Uh, <clears throat> my background is as a vascular surgeon, practiced for years. Uh, when I quit my clinical practice, I had been involved in some local physician, regional physician organization development, and some business development. Um, had a few sort of entrepreneurial years running a business and decided I really hated that um, and got an opportunity to come back into medicine uh, on the faculty. Currently, I uh, teach primarily preclinical medical students and also in the director of surgical education for the college. I uh, I'm the curriculum development director of our surgical residency program. And it's been about five years ago, I combined with the College of Business to create this uh, personal finance elective for our fourth year students. Currently, uh, we have uh, probably about 90% plus or minus of our fourth year students now take the elective and it's been pretty well received. Uh, Kabir is former president of the Business and Medicine Group and uh, faculty advisor. So it's kind of how we get started working together. Happy to be here. Thank you. Next up, we have Dr. Sharma. Hey, I'm uh, Sanjay Sharma. I guess you wear a few different hats. I'm a uh, retina specialist, uh, professor of ophthalmology at Queen's University in Canada. Um, you know, I'm uh, someone who's super passionate about medical education. I've created a series of of online platforms, uh, you know, MedSkill is, is probably the most prominent one. We, we're an open access uh, platform that now reaches um, students from over 400 universities. Um, you know, increasingly we're uh, creating uh, some assets around kind of finance 101 because I think while we do a fantastic job teaching medical students how to be great doctors, at the end of the day, you know, you're running a small business and a lot of people don't really quite realize that. Um, you know, I've, I've been involved in a number of things in the in the sort of finance world, from you know an angel investor uh, to uh, to creating you know a, a series of companies. So um, you know, happy to, to talk to anyone about uh, about finance and what uh, you know important financial habits are for medical students. Thank you so much for those introductions. Um, so this program is geared towards first generation minority medical students, but I hope that what we discuss will also be helpful for all medical students, whether or not you identify with those um, two groups. So being a minority and or first generation medical student can present with some unique challenges, which builds one's character. 
How can certain character traits be useful when tackling finances during medical school? Uh, specifically as a student, I think that's some of the character traits that um, can definitely help here. First most is long-term planning. Like anything in medicine, the financial aspect of it is a really long-term game and it's not something that can happen overnight. And I think the best way to really feel like you have control and really tackle your financial obligations and debt and other um, issues like that is to create a long-term plan and kind of just stay on track and to have confidence in, in your planning and your ability to stay on course um, for many years. At Florida State, we have a mission that uh, really is dedicated to increasing enrollment among minority um, applicants and students from underserved communities. What I find is oftentimes these students have a, a strong uh, work ethic. Uh, they have a lot of uh, self-reliance. Uh, often they come from backgrounds where they didn't perhaps get the guidance um, that students from other backgrounds have. And uh, and they've had many of them experience with the importance of, uh, of the connection, if you will, between hard work and success, both financial and academic. You know, I, I just like would like to add one other thing. I would say resourcefulness as well. So, you know, I, I look at it. Um, there's there's lots of opportunities out there. There's there's you know we're transforming in a lot of different ways. I'd say in the past you know ten years, uh, things have been dramatically different in terms of technology. You know, we're we're moving into a Web 3.0 world. Um, so I think sort of leveraging your own unique area, you know, in, in terms of your culture, might also open a lot of opportunities. You know, as an investor or you know, someone who may want to to create a, a business as well. And so, I always you know recommend to our students that you know don't just look at medicine as a, as the end game, and that's you know a, a sort of a linear thing. Also, think of some of the other opportunities that are out there that you can leverage, you know, with your expertise to open up other doors too. Thank you for all those wonderful answers. I completely agree with you. And I think that the challenges that first generation students have had going to medical school can definitely be very useful for um, surviving and thriving in medical school. Um, so the second question I have is, during medical school, what aspects of financial literacy should a student prioritize? For example, should they prioritize investing, paying down interest, cutting down on expenses, helping out family or spending on one's wellness? I would be glad to offer an opinion on that. I would say that the most important thing for medical students is to start, uh, is to focus on budgeting, cash flow management. Uh, the biggest issue that I see in our graduating students with large debt loads is that it's the approach that most students take, which is how much can I get per semester, per year? In fact, what they should do is create a budget first, how much do I need, and then restrict their borrowing. Uh, we've had students uh, do a lot of crazy things with borrowed money, including uh, invest one semester's check in Bitcoin. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, again, especially students who come from uh, maybe underprivileged backgrounds, and don't have any experience personally with financial management to give a large check on the first day of a semester uh, without any uh, preparatory budgeting education or cash management education is really a tough thing and in some ways almost unfair in my opinion. Uh, so that'd be my first um, uh, recommendation for medical students is determine how much you absolutely have to borrow and then only borrow that much. Yeah, you know, I'd love to also um, kind of echo that. And especially, you know, we're moving into an era of, of, of certainly higher interest rates. So, um, you know, just managing your debt, I think is going to be absolutely critical. And then I think once you've got your, you know, you're moving in the right direction. I remember reading a phenomenal book called The Wealthy Barber. Uh, and, and there's three words in that book that really stuck with me. And that's pay yourself first, in the sense, you know, no matter what your paycheck is, make sure that you keep some of it. Uh, and then you can A, pay down debt or, you know, B, just, just use that cash flow in terms of purchasing, a, you know, some kind of uh, a good investment or asset. But uh, yeah, I, it, it kind of makes me very nervous in terms of people, you know, taking on increasingly large amounts of debt, knowing that interest rates are going to be rising. So. 
You took care of the nation. It's time for the nation to take care of you. The AMA stood by America's physicians and patients during the pandemic, and we're not stopping there. We're fixing prior authorization, leading the charge on Medicare payment reform, supporting telehealth, fighting scope creep, and reducing physician burnout. It's time to rebuild, and the AMA is ready. To learn more about the AMA Recovery Plan for America's Physicians, go to ama-assn.org slash time to rebuild. I think something else to add on is that uh, a lot of students that should kind of remember this even without any sort of financial um, experience is that a dollar borrowed today is not a dollar paid back. Um, it's very important to remember that for most medical students, they're not going to be able to pay back most of their loans until maybe six to 10 years after when they take out those loans. And besides the recent uh, interest rate um, freezing, this can be upwards of 6% a year. So over 10 years, if you borrow a dollar today, you're going to be paying back $2 then, and that's post-tax money. So to pay back $2 then is going to be making almost $3 or more than $3. So $100,000 today might not seem like a lot to some people based on their future income, but remember that they're going to have to earn two or three times that to pay back every dollar. Absolutely. Um, so the next question we have is for students of a minority and or first generation background, what are some cultural aspects one must consider prior to entering medicine? Well, um, I think it's a little bit hard to answer this question only because uh, there's so many different variables. Uh, medicine um, has its own culture. And um, I think that a person who's adaptable and uh, open-minded and interested in expanding their experiences and uh, is, is, uh, is well-prepared to become a physician. Um, certainly we have uh, respect and concern for unique cultures that people have uh, from their their backgrounds. And, and I think it's important and terrific when we have physicians who can relate on an experiential level with those cultures. But I think probably the thing I, I'd most emphasize is that medicine is a new culture for most people. And uh, unless you happen to come from a family of physicians, uh, and even if you do, you probably don't really have insight understanding of what that culture is going to look like feel like just what, what it's going to do to change you as a person over time uh, so flexibility resilience uh, self-reliance all the things that make a good student make, can make a good doctor as long as they maintain um, the effort and the dedication and the focus on their new career I, I, this i don't think makes that much difference uh, if you will, uh, from with reference to the page to the person's background, um, I think we all have to go through this huge cultural transition from college student to becoming a physician. Um, that's just my opinion on that. You know, I, I'm happy to chime in um, in regards in regards to this. So, you know, I I look at it from two different ways. I think that um, you know, being culturally sensitive. Uh, you know, you, you want to pay respect, you know, to wisdom, maybe that, that's being imparted from your elders, um, which I think is very important. I also think that you know, there's a lot of opportunities to invest in your own community that are, you know, creating new businesses and things like that. Um, so I, I certainly see a big push uh, in terms of innovation and supporting innovation on that front. Um, the other side of the coin, though, is I, I would also, I mean, I, I feel fundamentally that things are moving very, very quickly in terms of technology. Um, and so, you know, we, we've talked a little bit about Bitcoin and, um, you know, NFTs, and there's, we're kind of moving into just like this new potential era. And so, you know, while I think it's important to, to listen to elders and, you know, be rooted maybe in, into some traditions, I think it's also extremely important to be open-minded and try to understand where things are going. Uh, and, and that allows you to think in very innovative ways, um, you know, which could unlock a lot of, uh, a lot of financial potential for you as well. Uh, speaking culturally, uh, something uh, from a little different uh, angle is that um, a lot of cultures and other nationalities, and especially among first generation students, debt is viewed as um, a very bad thing and sometimes a predatory thing. I know certain religions and certain cultures 
um, view debt as something that must be avoided at all costs. And this kind of um, is totally at odds with how most students are able to attend medical school. Um, so I think it's important to remember that um, any sort of debt that you do take on is an investment in your own education and your own future and career and earning potential as well. I appreciate all the uh, varied uh, views on this topic from the culture shock um, that we all go through when going through medical school to the cultural sensitivity to um, the uh, taking on of debt. So I appreciate all those varied opinions there. Um, so the fourth question is, when it comes to finances in medical school, what is the biggest misconception that students have? Or what is the biggest mistake students make that can be detrimental to their financial future? I think uh, the biggest mistake is borrowing more money than you absolutely need. Borrowing money to do things other than get your education. If you look at medical school debt in general, student loan debt, but specifically medical school debt, uh, it's really an investment debt, you know, uh, and it, it, it's investment debt, I, it, conceptually to me, is a little different than say consumer debt or car loan debt or something like that. If you borrow $250,000 to go to medical school um, and depending on your specialty, your return, your earnings from that borrowing on the basis of your degree might be anywhere from say five to $12 million or more life long compared to a similarly educated person in another field. So investment debt that actually is not a bad debt. The problem is making it larger than it needs to be, number one, and probably the other biggest mistake is sources of debt. Um, you know, particularly some of the private and uh, plus loan things are are very difficult to deal with because of the higher interest. Uh, jumping off of what Dr. Sweeney said, I kind of alluded to it earlier, but um, the average debt among medical school graduates in the U.S. is um, in the ballpark of around two hundred and fifty thousand a year. And when most medical students consider this, they don't really re they think that that's what they're going to pay back. But um, after residency in medical school and any other sort of training, you're gonna be paying upwards of maybe close to double that. And then, as I said earlier, this is post-tax income. So people, I feel like, don't tend to really understand the gravity of how much they have to pay back and when. And that's something very important to remember. The, uh, the only other thing I would add to that is, you know, the people who are lending you the money uh, have a vested interest in terms of, of you taking on more and more debt. So, um, you, you know, banks, you know, they're, they're in the business of lending money. And so they're going to incentivize you to take these, these larger and larger loans. So, you know, just be careful to, to sort of take as much money as you need and only as much money as you need, because you're going to need to service that debt, pay it back. Uh, and, uh, you know, as, as we've just, uh, you know, as Kabir has mentioned, um, you know that that kind of balloons, and especially if interest rates increase, it can it can increase you know significantly. Right. So what I'm getting at is that most students need to be aware of the amount that they're borrowing because it will definitely balloon in the future, in terms of interest rates over time. Um, so that's the main takeaway from that question there. All right. So the fifth question is: How can the current financial climate in the U.S. be improved? so that those with financial barriers or those who don't have physicians in their families can pursue medicine? Uh, with regards to uh, at least pursuing medicine, um, I think we talked about it a little bit about it earlier, but um, the way that uh, education costs in the um, country have been rising and how financial institutions have been so um, able to just allow for such high um, amounts of debt and student loan burden, um, something that I think is um, pretty difficult for first generation minority students to try and get into medical school is just the amount of costs that there are to even apply. And this is even before any of these um, medical school loans can get dispersed or anything. Because um, I remember even just uh, trying to get the materials necessary to take the MCAT, study for the entrance exam, applying to medical schools, buying plane tickets for all the interviews, and going to these interviews um, was definitely in the thousands of dollars. 
And I think that this is something that um, can hopefully be kind of adjusted to try and um, make it so that a broader group of students can successfully apply for medical school without being turned away due to financial reasons. My uh, response is uh, it hard to change a financial system, um, but um, I think that if we can uh, develop some type of uh, uh, funding support uh, that would help students afford the cost of application, interviews, travel, et cetera. Uh, I also think that uh, spending more time in uh, with students from underserved backgrounds, for example, I usually at least once or twice a year, will um, give talks to uh, the Minority Association of Pre-Med Students uh, here on campus or uh, undergraduate uh, program in, in medical sciences, pre-med, uh, and try to recruit, you know, as part of a recruiting effort. And we have several other programs on campus to do that. Uh, many of them do come with some kind of financial resources that will support or help support the application process. I will say it's much more difficult uh, coming from out of state than it is in state, as one might expect since we're state uh, sponsored medical school. You know, I would just I would just add a couple of uh, points. I mean, I, I you know agree with uh, what's already been said. I mean, you know, clearly, um, you know, allowing or or getting you know more underrepresented people into uh, into medical school is, is kind of a multifactorial thing. So um, 100%, I mean, we, we need to have stronger role models uh, in the various underrepresented communities who are actually, um, you know, showing what it's like to be in medicine. And so uh, we're actually working in, in Canada with a number of uh, upper, underrepresented kids in, in or communities in high school, actually, uh, to, to sort of help them rotate through a virtual program uh, to show them what it's like in 11 different uh, disciplines. Um, but without a doubt, I mean, I think that even in our country, in Canada, there's a lot of financial barriers uh, to, uh, to getting into medical school. And so I think, you know, lowering those barriers, um, whether it's through scholarships or, or, you know, bursaries, I think is, is very, very important. But again, the, the more that we've got role models that truly represent those communities, I think, you know, we'll, we'll pull more, more of this, uh, the next generation into the field. So. Right, I completely agree with all of the speakers' um, uh, points there. Uh, from you know having more role models from underrepresented communities to um, having more financial support for students who are applying to medical school, and that goes into applying for residency as well. So the sixth question is kind of twofold. So, what is your greatest takeaway for students who have large amounts of debt from medical school? Or do you have any fun stories about how you've taken control of your finances as a medical student, resident, or attending? Uh, I think like a, my greatest takeaway would be to uh, budget now, get in the habit of kind of making a financial uh, plan, how much you're gonna borrow, how much you're gonna spend and on what, continue this. And once you start making money, to allocate a set amount that you budget to pay back um, loans every time, every um, payment and to really pay yourself first. And when I say pay yourself, basically paying the debt. And if the debt's wiped out to kind of pay your investments and savings before you kind of allocate money for other things. And if you stick to this, you should be golden financially. Yeah, I would add to that, uh, as far as the uh, takeaway for students, uh, don't panic over the debt. Uh, panic is, uh, is the worst thing you could do because often we have students that uh, don't even know how much they owe or to whom they owe it. And uh, if you uh, if you approach it that way, sort of the head in the sand technique, uh, that will spiral. And, uh, you know, the beauty of compound interest is is working against you in this case, as Kabir pointed out earlier. And uh, so my response is don't panic, you know. Uh, Panic is somebody who's borrowed, you know, two hundred and fifty thousand dollars and has a degree in I don't know art history or something, which is a good field, but there's no way that you'll ever pay that back at the salary levels, no matter what specialty our physicians or our graduates choose. If they manage their debt appropriately, even with the accrued interest that'll occur over the years of training, et cetera, 
they will be able to manage that debt load and it, it either pay it back or at the very least pay it back to the level uh, to satisfy the public student loan forgiveness uh, requirements. So, so I, you know, I really think the main uh, takeaway is don't panic, you know, uh, don't take out any more debt than you need, but don't panic over what you had to borrow to get through medical school. It was an investment debt that will uh, pay off in the end and it will provide, it will create a debt load service, debt servicing requirement for you going forward that you will be able to manage. And um, that's my biggest advice to our your recommendation to our students. Um, yeah, I'm going to highlight a couple of stories that, uh, uh, you know, that, that really speak to the, the concept of building kind of financial muscle, because we're all attuned to, you know, reading books and studying super hard or hitting the gym to, you know, increase our, our strength. Uh, but, but, you know, funny enough, I mean, I, I'm going back to like 25 plus years ago when I was a, a fellow. Um, and so I'm a retina specialist. I, I trained in Philadelphia and my oldest son uh, was born in Philadelphia. And I remember driving from Philadelphia to Jersey, and this may not be applicable anymore, but I would drive to Jersey to like, you know, get tons and tons of diapers for him because there was actually no sales tax, uh, you know, in Jersey. And again, I, I don't know if it's a reflection anymore, but, uh, and then the secondly, when I when we moved back, we bought our first house. We literally, you know, financed room by room. So we lived in, you know, kind of like a two bedroom uh, thing, and we we bought furniture for those two rooms. And then six months later, after we paid that off, we, we you know furnished the next room. And that you know maybe a little bit too austere for for today's uh, you know today's uh, reality. But I mean that was the reality. We we paid off things uh, you know right away as as best we could. Um, and and I really do think we do need to get in the habit. Like if there's one thing that I could recommend to medical students and residents is just start to get into the habit of, you know, if you've, if you've borrowed money, you got to pay it off. And the quicker you pay it off, you know, the faster you're going to get out of debt and, and think of it like a muscle. And I guess the other, the other last thing I would do is be, you know, very aggressive in terms of learning, in terms of learning finances, right? So, so read, you know, some books around it, just, you know, basic, um, investing skills, you know, again, whether it's in the stock market, whether it's, you know, various assets, just try to learn uh, as much as you can about it, because the faster you're the master of these techniques, uh, the faster, A, you're going to get out of debt and be a, be a you know, successful investor. And, uh, uh, and I think that opens up a lot of doors for you. Thank you for those personal stories, Dr. Sharma, and the advice is um, learn as much as you can. Dr. Sweeney's advice is don't panic. And then Kabir's advice is to budget early. Are there any last uh, comments that any of the speakers want to provide? You know, I'm I'm, I'm going to if I could. Uh, you know, I just I, just because I read this this morning. Uh, you know, and and uh, Warren Buffett was asked about you know how he felt about these inflationary times, um, and uh, you know one of the things that he said was try to be the best person, you know, in your city or your town in what you do. And the sense that you know where where money you know is dramatically losing value in high inflationary times, you know we could potentially go back to a barter system, and that's probably very very unlikely. Uh, but the the point simply is this: you've invested, you know, you've got a medical degree, uh, which is outstanding. You know, like the people who are who should be very concerned at times like this are people who are like SoundCloud rappers and people you know potentially are TikTokers because you know there's not necessarily a very strong skill set associated with that. You, know, you guys have made the investment. Um, you know it's been a long haul, uh, but you you know, you you have phenomenal skills, and those skills are always going to be in in demand, especially you know as our population is aging. So I would sort of echo echo something that Dr. Sweeney said. You know, don't panic not only because of the debt that you may have accumulated, but you've invested in incredible skills that are always going to be marketable. Thank you so much. I do agree that medical school is truly an investment of our time and energy, and we've sacrificed so much to get here. And I want to thank you so much to all the speakers, Kabir, Dr. Sweeney, and Dr. Sharma, for taking time out of your busy days to be a part of this program. Uh, once again, this is part of the AMA Medical Student Section under the Minority Issues Committee. And thank you so much for spending your day with us. This has been Making the Rounds, a podcast.
podcast by the American Medical Association. You can subscribe to Making the Rounds and other great AMA podcasts by visiting ama-assn.org slash podcast. Thanks for listening.